Mesopotamia, it's a whole new world to explore and conquer. I'm Steve Coleman, joined by Todor Nikolov, unearthing Mesopotamia's ancient empires. Let's start in Babylon. What makes them special? How do they play? Well, Babylonians are generally the faction that builds tall. They want to get prepared before they march off uh, on the offensive. So their buildings, for example, often combine different uh, effects, so you can achieve more with a single building. Their command allows them to suddenly increase their recruitment capabilities, which helps both when you defend your lands and when you attack your uh, enemies. And in addition, they have access to the city of Babylon, which is a one settlement province and is uh, rather huge. In addition to that, they're relying on the god Marduk for a variety of bonuses that help them on the defensive, like unit upkeep and replenishment. Yes, so the Mesopotamian gods, we've got uh, Ninurta, Asher, Ishtar, Inshushanak, and Marduk, right? And they have dwellings. Can you tell us a bit more about those? Dwellings is um, an additional building that represents the home of a particular god and you can build a home uh, to a god in every one of your settlement uh, for an additional uh, drop of favor and some uh, god-specific effects. So you have your temples, you have your shrines, if you are praying to Mesopotamian gods you have your dwellings and this means that you can actually maximize the favor tier to a god uh, with much fewer territories, which is very valuable for the Babylonians in particular. Okay, so it sounds like the Babylonians are quite an inward-looking faction. Uh, Marduk's a good fit for them god-wise, but what ancient legacy would you say would best suit them? It would definitely be the ancient legacy of Hammurabi, the creator of one of the first Code of Laws. And this is what the player can do with the ancient legacy. They can have their own Code of Laws. And each law is a combination of effects that you choose from a list, and this might be both positive, which brings you bonuses, but also takes more time, and or penalties. You can also put negative effects to reduce the time it takes for a law to uh, be efficient. In addition to that, the more laws you have, the more Kuduru resource you uh, receive, and you can spend this to instantly research royal decrees or also research greater and more powerful effects for your laws. Great, okay, so the opposite of an inward-looking faction might be an ambitious one. Um, Hanig Albat has entered the fray. What are they like? Yes, Hanig Albat are actually a kingdom of Assyrians, and their uh, ruler uh, really very much like, likes to be the ruler of the entire Assyria, so they are much more on the offensive. They can recruit from very early in the campaign a lot of units. They can also uh, create buildings which provide them with experienced generals that come at a very affordable price. And in addition to that, they also have horsemen from very early in the campaign. Horsemen are quite fragile, but also more maneuverable than chariots. Their faction command in particular uh, grants them a resource, military training, which scales with the number of ongoing wars and you can spend this resource to directly upgrade your units in an army of your choice, which means that you need to go completely total war. <laughs> the more wars you are participating in, the, the stronger your armies will, will get. Okay, so would you say they fancy themselves as a kind of king of the universe then? Yes, quite. Uh, king of the universe is actually the title of the supreme ruler of the Mesopotamian court. And the main difference between the Mesopotamian court and the court of other great powers at the time was Egypt. that the Mesopotamian court and king of the universe had under him not a vizier or a high priest or whatever. He had kings below him. And in the game, these are the king of Hanigalbat, the king of Asher, the king of Elam, and the king of Babylon. Each of those positions, the lesser kings, comes with their own plots and intrigues and elite units. Actually, it's a bit of a trivia that um, the first king who used the king of the universe title likely was uh, Sargon of Akkad, Sargon the Great. And to get their hands on the throne, the Sargon of Akkad ancient legacy sounds perfect. Yes, quite. The ancient legacy of Sargon is all about ambition. With it, you can have more ambitions at a time. You can have control over what kind of ambitions you receive, because there are different ambition archetypes. Some are related to politics, some are related to warfare. By completing these ambitions of a certain archetype, you get points which in turn unlock you additional bonuses that are relevant to the archetype. So if you complete warlike ambitions, 
you will get more uh, bonuses that help you in war. In addition to that, with this Ancient Legacy, you gain access to Grand Ambitions, which provide you with uh, the opportunity to uh, complete more different and more difficult objectives, but also their rewards are much greater and they provide you with victory points. And in this way, they are a valid way for you to achieve a campaign victory along with your ordinary conquering the world. Prince of Ur and Protector of Nippur. So there we are, one new culture, seven total playable factions, two new ancient legacies, new gods and related mechanics, and new regalia to chase. The ancient world is spilling its secrets, but next time let's go somewhere a little bit more familiar. We're heading back to the Aegean.